This week on Georgia Traveler, zip on down to Whitesburg to the world's largest continuous zip line canopy tour at historic Banning Mills. 600 feet long over the creek and getting up to 170 feet high at points. Pitch a luxurious tent in LJ at the ultimate glamorous camping getaway known as the Martin House. Beautiful. Soar into one of Atlanta's best kept secrets, the Delta Heritage Museum. It's not every day that the general public can walk out and walk around underneath an airplane. And journey down to Arlington to Southwest Georgia's premier vineyard and winery known as Still Pond. The Still Pond is known for producing quality alcohol products. Light and crisp, not overly oh, sweet. Fantastic. All that and more on this episode of Georgia Traveler. We begin this week's journey at historic Banning Mills in Whitesburg, where you can zip from tree to tree at speeds of 60 miles per hour. Here lies the remains of an old textile mill in Banning, Georgia, an 1800s era mill located just 30 miles southwest of Atlanta on the Snake Creek, a once thriving industrial complex confirmed by the Georgia Institute of Technology as the birthplace of the modern day paper industry. But what's left of historic Banning Mills now? A broken dam, the ruins of a once powerful paper mill, and overgrown sluices for the mill running parallel to the Rocky Gorge. However, in 1997, Mike and Donna Holder bought this storied land, now considered Whitesburg, Georgia, and built a beautiful bed and breakfast that overlooks the gorge. It does have that mountain-like feeling, but you're not in the mountains. It's a very historic piece of property. It ranges from the Creek Indians all the way to the early industrial area. So you can walk on Old Town Road, you can walk on Old Water Raceways and see the ruins of the mills. You get the mountain-like feeling um, on the trails here. Very unique, this close to Atlanta. Enjoy a home-cooked meal at the main lodge and settle down in one of the 47 country rooms, including five cabins and 10 rustic cottages. Mike and Donna were naturally interested in the history of the land, but when they brought Carroll County historian Doug Mabry in to research these grounds, they were blown away with what he found. This was way ahead of the time. It was state-of-the-art facility. The whole gorge was a paper mills, cotton mills, cotton gins, uh, grist mills, everything. The whole gorge and all the hills were just full of mill villages. In its heyday, the water power at Banning Mills produced enough energy to create electricity for the entire town years before most major southern cities, including Atlanta. In fact, they found diaries that talk about day-long horse and buggy rides from Atlanta to watch the lights come on at Banning. But as you stroll the 1,200-acre property, you will often hear a rustling in the treetops or catch a glimpse of a person seemingly flying through the air. That's because this B&B also boasts the largest continuous zipline canopy tour in the world. Reaching speeds over 60 miles per hour across the treetops and over rushing water and rolling hills, Historic Banning Mills offers more than just a high adrenaline zipline induced rush. It's an escape from the conventional vacation in a picture perfect setting. Well, it started as a bed and breakfast mostly and it has morphed into a adventure site. I decided to bring my co-host Cad on this high wire excursion for a good time in the trees and more importantly, to take the first plunge. Now you're safe. Looks like you're going first too. Hey! Oh, is that what that means? <laughs> All these men and I have to go first? Like, if you would, please. Oh man, this is the one time I regret ladies first. Oh From treetop to treetop, Cat and I conquered the canopy tour. Of course, we then find out that was just the warm-up adventure. The first course is called the Forest Tour. Nine zip lines going through old growth forest, and they're a little lower. Some of them are pretty high, but it does teach them to do the things they need to do in the more longer extreme lines. And it, it goes from there to the flight pattern, which is instead of going through the trees, you're going over the trees. 
and then you're walking through the treetops again. High five! Oh, we were flying. That's right. Well, you ready for the next one? What next one? The Screaming Eagle. I thought that was the Screaming Eagle. <laughs> That's the warm up. You mean there's something else? Oh, yeah. Much longer, much faster. Oh, no. The tower sits about 302 feet above the creek itself. The tower platform is 102 feet off the ground and 122 to the pinnacle at the top. And when you turn around, you got a really nice panoramic view of the entire uh, Snake Creek Gorge. Uh, then you're coming out over the gorge and you're really starting to pick up speed and you're going through the gorge and you'll be doing anywhere from 55 to 70 miles an hour down through there. And you've got to watch the winds because you've got gale force winds starting to affect the way you travel. So after the Screaming Eagle, I was inspired with a feeling of invincibility. So it was off to Terminator Corner, an extreme rope course challenge that had to be more exhausting than running a marathon. In fact, uh, you go to the Terminator Corner, you get a Braveheart, but the bridges have no rail. Very challenging, very challenging, even for me and some of our rock climbers, they, it just wears them out. Yeah. From there, it's off to Skytrek Bridge. It is over 600 feet long over the creek and getting up to 170 feet high at points. Right smack in the middle of the Skytrack Bridge, over 150 feet high right here. All of it is still eco-tourism. It's your being able to look at it in a little more, uh, instead of just walking around looking at trees, you're up in the tops of the trees and going through the trees. Believe it or not, the wildlife are getting really used to it. Mike and Donna continue expanding the Canopy Adventure Tour, dreaming up new challenges and obstacles, but sticking to their original pledge that Mother Nature is respected throughout. It's a team building experience where the biggest reward is seeing pure joy on the visitors' faces. We do have families come here and say this is the first time my kids have actually asked me to do something with them in, in, in years. And with tears in their eyes, even, saying, saying thank you for having this here so our kids can actually do this with them. Ziplining at historic Banning Mills isn't only for tourists like myself. Mike, a former Army officer and Screaming Eagle, invites soldiers from nearby Fort Benning to partake in this zipline adventure. That's because soldiers coming back from duty often need some kind of adrenaline release. They're looking for something to be excited about. Their body's craving it. So the commanders pick people out that actually need to release, and that's through the Adventure Quest program at Fort Benning and other posts. And they come here and they ask us to take them out and get them very excited. And we do. They have a good time. City Slickers Cat and Ricky get back to nature at a camping trip in LJ, but glamping at the Martin House means fine linens and gourmet meals. This is certainly a familiar sight to many city dwellers. Traffic and congestion wherever you turn. So when Ricky Bevington and I decided it was time to get back to nature, we headed to the North Georgia mountain town of Elijay for some R&R. First stop, Elijay's Weekly Farmer's Market. All right. This looks great. Are you from Elijay? Oh, yes. Lived here my whole life. 72 and never lived in Gilman County my whole life. What's great about Elijay? All these mountains and friendly people. Friendly people indeed, as Ricky and I were quick to find out. Located just 90 minutes north of Atlanta in Georgia's Blue Ridge Mountains, Elijay, which means new ground place, was originally settled by the Cherokee Indians. Today, it's also a part of Georgia's apple capital, producing more than 600,000 bushels of apples annually. But today, Ricky and I aren't in Elijay for the apples. We're going on the ultimate girlfriend getaway at the Martin House. And even though we'll be sleeping in tents, the Martin House experience is anything but camping. In fact, Martin House co-founder Joanne Antonelli calls her unique bed and breakfast experience glamorous camping or glamping. Welcome, glampers. Hi, are you Joanne? I am. I'm Kat. Welcome to the Martin House. Thank you. That's Ricky. Hey, Ricky. Welcome. Thank you. We're glad to be here. We're happy to have you. Great. You guys ready to take the tour? We are. And what a tour it was. How big is the property? As Ricky and I followed Joanne along the many trails that wind through the 18 acres of pristine forest, it was clear that the Martin House truly is the perfect weekend getaway for any girly girl from the city looking to get back to nature without giving up the comforts of home. I think I wore the wrong shoes for this. Well, 
Those are actually glamping shoes because they are glamorous. Oh, okay, in that case, I fit right in. First, we peeked into Joanne's artist studio and then took a walk in the garden where Joanne grows flowers and many of the vegetables featured on the Martin House menu of homemade dishes. Uh, we do tomatoes and zucchini and onions and squash and beans and potatoes, your usual. Not our usual. <laughs> we live in the city. <laughs> Next, it was time to check out where we city girls would be sleeping and what really makes the Martin House a unique back to nature bed and breakfast experience. The adorably named Gypsy Fairy Tent that Joanne has imported from India. First up, Nightingale Nest. This one's mine. Three to the tent of a covered veranda. And that's not all. They're also beautifully appointed with private sitting areas, luxurious bedding, and private bathrooms. Where's my tent? Your tent's at the end of the ridge, okay? That's right, I was staying in Hummingbird Haven, which overlooks a lovely meadow. Early in the morning, often down in this meadow, you can see little herds of deer. <gasps> Look, beautiful. Next, we saw where tonight's farm to table banquet would be held for those of us staying at the Martin House, as well as about 40 other guests from the area. Held four times a year, the Martin House dinners typically take on a theme of the season, and tonight's theme, water. But since dinner was still hours away, Ricky and I decided to indulge in some of the other offerings at the Martin House. In true glamper fashion, Ricky went for a nice long massage. While I decided to try my hand at chopping wood, platform shoes and all, with Joanne's partner, Rick. One's enough. One's enough. I'm good. Fortunately, Joanne came by just in time. You want to go to the studio and play with me? I do. Come on. Thanks. Better than chopping wood. Definitely. Come on in. I think this is more my speed. It is. You can even take your shoes off. Oh, great. Ah, those glamorous shoes. First, Joanne showed me some of the pottery she creates on site. And as an added treat, guests like me can learn how to make our own. OK, OK. <laughs> I even got to see how Joanne creates her signature all-natural bath products found in each of our tents. And speaking of tents, the other guests staying at the Martin House that weekend were checking out theirs. While over at the homestead, dinner preparations were being completed by tonight's featured chef for the farm-to-table banquet under the stars. Dinner guests from around the area were starting to arrive, so Ricky and I changed for the evening and joined the festivities. And after a lovely cocktail party, complete with live music, old friends and new enjoyed a delicious multi-course farm-to-table dinner with dishes including chilled cucumber dill gazpacho, Georgia mountain trout with roasted corn, basil, and tomato sauce, and Georgia peach cake. A perfect ending to a perfect day for a couple of glampers like Ricky and me. So if you're looking to spend a weekend getting back to nature, but with luxurious surroundings, friendly people, and good food, consider spending a weekend under the stars at the Martin House. Good night. You can see that this is Hangar 1, so Delta is right here. Still to come on Georgia Traveler, one of Atlanta's hidden gems, the Delta Heritage Museum. This particular one, the first one used by Delta to carry passengers. We also head down to southwest Georgia to sample some divine fruit from the vine. I can crisp, not overly oh, sweet. That's fantastic. Slightly. Georgia Traveler is coming right back. Welcome back to Georgia Traveler. Let's join special contributor Bruce Burkhardt in Atlanta's own Delta Heritage Museum. Not far from the world's busiest airport, Atlanta's Hartsfield Jackson International, sits a reminder of a very different time. 
This is a wonderful photograph. This is the original Atlanta Terminal in the 1930s and 40s. Okay, that tells me. And you can see that this is Hangar 1, so Delta is right here. This is where we are now. Mm -hmm. A museum, a most unusual museum in that it's one of Atlanta's best kept secrets. This was actually good service for 1929. The ads for Traveler call this the limousine of the air. The history of Delta Airlines, a history of commercial aviation, is housed here in Hangar 1, the very first hangar Delta built when they moved here in 1941. This is the early 1940s, and Hangar 1 is actually, this is the oldest facility on airport property in Atlantis today. So it's like the building housing the museum is a it's, museum itself. It is. The Delta Air Transport Heritage Museum has been around for about 15 years, but visited primarily by Delta employees and their guests. Now, they'd like to make it available to everyone. This is a replica of a half-daylon duster, crop duster. The Delta story has humble beginnings as a crop dusting company in Monroe, Louisiana. In fact, Delta may be the only airline founded by an entomologist, an insect scientist. This speaks about Delta's beginnings as a crop dusting company, and it talks about the boll weevil, which was really attacking the southern states at the time, and why it was so urgent to try to develop crop dusting effort at the time. In 1929, one of our posters proclaimed, now you can fly between Dallas and Birmingham. Daily service, swift and comfortable. It was Delta's founder, C.E. Woolman, then an assistant to the chief entomologist at the crop dusting company, who wanted to start carrying passengers. And they did, starting in 1929. This was Delta's first headquarters, a former gas station in Monroe, Louisiana. A replica facade of that building is also part of this museum. This is an aircraft that looks like the first passenger plane for Delta. Delta flew Travel Air sedans. They uh, held six people, including pilot. And uh, this plane flew 95 miles per hour. I don't see how the beverage cart is going to get through here. But advancements came quickly in those early years. In only about 10 years, the airline industry went from this to this, what is really the pride of the museum. Remember when Humphrey Bogart bid a foggy farewell to Ingrid Bergman on the tarmac at the end of the movie Casablanca? We'll always have Paris. Well, the airplane she boarded was this, the DC-3. It was the workhorse of all the airlines back in the 1940s, and this particular one was the first one used by Delta to carry passengers. Here's looking at you, kid. This is the plane that made airlines profitable. Finally, you were able to carry enough passengers that you could make profit from a passenger service rather than from the air, air mail subsidies that they had been relying on previously. It took five years to restore this airplane, the very first airplane to be recognized by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. That's why you need the gloves and booties. Wow, it's steep. This is very steep. You know, it's a tail dragger aircraft, so you're not level. And how many and this seat? This seat, 21 passengers. And uh, you have uh, the colors, the interior looks just like it did. So this is what it would be like when you walked in the plane in 1941 to fly. You'd have one flight attendant greeting you. And you have your copy of Life magazine from December 23rd. 1940. That's the day that it left uh, Douglas and the plane was delivered to Delta. About 40 years later, things got even better and bigger. This is a 767 parked in Hangar 2 next door. Especially meaningful to Delta employees, the spirit of Delta was actually purchased by Delta workers for the airline back in the early 80s when the company was having some financial problems. Retired Captain Chick Smith has a lot of miles on this airplane. It's not every day that the general public can walk out and walk around underneath an airplane and go over and stand next to the tires and see how big they are and walk inside as well for a look at the proud history of an airplane bought by employees. But this museum also speaks to another story, the relationship between the city of Atlanta and the airline that moved here 70 years ago. And because of that partnership, that's what you see here today. Delta operates over 1,100 flights a day on peak days here. You can go literally anywhere in the world starting in Atlanta, and that's a, a partnership that is, has paid off nicely for all constituents. And what about this for a gift shop? The inside of a giant jet, the L-1011, a 
or rather half of the fuselage that was once used as a movie set. You can even go up front and sit in the roomy cockpit. Though they charge no admission here, a donation is requested. And since this museum sits on Delta's secure campus, you need to make arrangements for your visit ahead of time. For more information, go to our website at gpb.org slash Georgia Traveler. Let's go have a look at the uh, jet airplane. Visitors here can roam around the cabin of the Spirit of Delta, but not the cockpit, so we thought we'd give you a look. Upon first seeing an airplane with TV screens instead of the old electromechanical instruments, it was kind of, I mean, the clock wasn't even obvious, you know? You kind of had to look around, where is it? Right. Yeah, they do have a clock, you know? It's a it's kind of a digital looking thing. That was the toughest thing to learn how to work. People come up and, uh, how do you learn all these buttons and switches? And, I would say, well, it's pretty simple. Everything's labeled. And if you can read, you could probably fly. And it had a lot of auto functions. We had three autopilots. Throttles were automatic. This airplane had auto land capability. And the autopilots would land the airplane. It was, it was magic. <laughs> it was great. It was a, just a super airplane to fly. You, uh, miss, you miss it? You miss being up here? Oh, yeah. I'd much rather drive than ride. <laughs> Uh, better view. Uh -huh. Chick Smith is one of the volunteer tour guides here at the museum. If you're lucky, you might get a chance to kick the tires with him. Kick, kick the, tires. the tires, that's it. Let's now head to Arlington to sample some sweet South Georgia muscadine at the Still Pond Vineyard and Winery. There's a little body of water in southwest Georgia that sparkles beneath a drape of Spanish moss. Legend has it that this old pond was once the source of an 1860s era still that produced peach brandy for thirsty Confederate troops. The still later became a corn whiskey producer during Prohibition years and eventually a backdrop to one of Georgia's oldest and most successful vineyards, which still stands today. The still pond is known for producing quality alcohol products. <laughs> so. Behold the muscadine, a little tougher skin than most grapes, but the fruit inside is sweet and divine. Charles Cowart's father began cultivating this vineyard back in the 1960s, and two generations later, they are still growing strong. In 2003, Stillpon revolutionized their business, adding a winery that ferments and bottles about 20% of their muscadine crop. We were the, the first winery south of Atlanta. Uh, amongst all the cotton, corn, and peanuts, and uh, then here's these rows and rows of grapes. 170 acres make up the Stillpon vineyards, and as you can see, these little muscadines are at the bud stage right now, but come August, they'll be in full canopy. We sell about 80% of our production here of the fruit to uh, southeastern United States wineries. Chateau Elan uh, is, is a familiar name here in, in Georgia as well as uh, Habersham and a number of wineries in Tennessee. Charlie Cowart grew up working this vineyard with his father and grandfather and his son Weston already has his own flavor of still pond wine, the Weston Reserve. This family business has grown every year since the creation of the winery and Charlie believes their success is in their original approach to winemaking. We knew we wanted a, a wine that we like to drink because it's the easiest way to sell something is if you like it. Yeah, uh, not what so, people uh, tell you it should taste like. That's yeah. right, that's yeah. right. And it's turned out pretty good for us so far. Of course, we do have around 20 different labels of wine and a, a lot of them are, are very different, uh, but they're all made from muscadines that we grow right here on the farm. This is the plantation wine. Real fruity, light and crisp, not overly oh, sweet. That's fantastic. Sweet. Yeah. This one is for the viewer. <laughs> good, huh? Good time. Oh, yeah. It's past noon. Is that right? good? You want that's some more? That's perfect. That's perfect. We got 19 others, right? That's true. Right. Got a long way to go. <laughs> Still Pond has an exceptional wine shop laid out like a country store and offers all 20 labels of their Still Pond wines in the more fruit based farmhouse wines. They even offer tours of the winery if someone wants to learn a little more about the muscadine winemaking process. Now here's a cool part of the tour here at Still Pond if you so wish to do it. Get into the bottom of a 5200 gallon white fermenter tank. Of course it will be sterilized after I leave. 
And while sitting in a fermenter is fun for non-claustrophobic individuals, celebrating the Muscadine at one of Still Pond's three annual festivals is hands down the best way to be introduced to the product. There's a holiday festival the first week in December, a grape stomp festival the first week in August, where you can hop in a barrel, dance a little bluegrass jig, making wine the old fashioned way, and there's a springtime event the first week of April known as the Bud Break Bash. Gotta get myself a still pond slushing. Right. So what kind of still pond wine we have in here? Plantation reds in this and plantation whites in this one. It's really good. All right, there we go. Award-winning wines from fruity to dry, served by the glass or in true festival form by the bottle, this veteran muscadine farming family knows their business as well as anyone. The Still Pond in South Georgia, where muscadine is king. Well, that's it for this episode of Georgia Traveler. We hope you join us next time. Until then, pleasant journey. Careful with that scarf, too. Lena, well, you know, gotta be fashionable while we're ziplining. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Fly behind you. Woo! Glad I didn't wear sandals. <laughs> or a skirt. Oh, darn it, I thought I brought the keys with me. You have the keys. I said no smoking, so coffee, tea, or me. Where's the bathroom? They advertise this as the limousine of the air. I hate to see what the Volkswagen bug of the air was. Georgia Traveler is produced in partnership with the Georgia Department of Economic Development. This is a GPB original production.